Good morning, everybody, and welcome on the Sunrise Safari here in the western fringes of the Sabi Sand Game Reserve, where we sit on Juma quarantine clearings at the moment, and there's a little giraffe sleeping off the night, chewing her cud, or his cud, I'm not sure if that's a him or a her, and a zebra waving its tail in the background, its impressive rump, uh, about to start glistening in the soon to rise African sun. Uh, you're on a live safari. My name is James Henry. On camera is Brian in uh, two jackets this morning because the temperature has dropped below 50 degrees Celsius for the first time. That's Brian's thumb. That's a pretty impressive thumb there you have, Brian. Well done. Thank you. Um, and you are, are, like I say, on a live safari, which means we want to hear from you. Hashtag safari live, questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email. Ask us questions, give us comments, tell us what you want to see and what you're hoping to see. There we go, getting up, and you can see how awkward that little process was. Out on the other vehicle, we've got Scott. Uh, he is going to be sort of walk driving, uh, so a bit of driving around in the Mahindra, and then walking with Steph and Andrew. In the final control, the dulcet tones of Nicky Austin in my ear, and the tap, tap, tapping on the keys of Geraldine Kent. Like I say, you are most welcome. Apparently, it's about 19 degrees Celsius, which is 66 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a very pleasant temperature. Uh, we had some rain last night. About four drops fell here. Um, when I walked out of my room this morning, I stepped into the sand outside with my bare feet, hoping to feel sort of puddles and things like that. But no, there was another puff of dust. So very little rain fell last night. I don't think we're going to find any puddles at all. Obviously, we're watching the Juma Dam cam during the course of the night, and you want to know if you heard thunder and heard rain. You did, definitely. Um, well, you certainly heard thunder. There was thunder, there was lightning, there was great promise. As I say, like politicians of this country, great promise, thunder and lightning, very little on the delivery front. There, I think, is the mother of this giraffe. Oh, she's just going behind a bush now, of course. <laughs> she's behind that tree there that you can see. much Rame, very kind um, kind <laughs> kind comments on the rain dance that Brian and I did yesterday. That seemed to work. I think we might have to do another one at some stage. Of course the creative process is not normally a very fast one and so it will take a while for us to be able to be so brilliant again. Don't you think Brian? Mm. Mm. But thank you very much for all your kind uh, enjoyment of, of the ridiculousness that we put out last night. Let me just sneak forward. Thank you, Clown Sharon. You say that we are wonderfully insane. That's very nice. If you can be wonderfully insane, I'm glad that we are. Um, and I mean, your Twitter handle is Clown Sharon, of course, so perhaps you're also a little on the uh, less than sane front. Are those rocks or will the best? bits of tree. So, we already started grazing this little fellow, and I, oh, I think this is a little fellow, and I'm pretty sure this is the little fellow that we've been watching now since about... Was he born, Brian? Probably around August? I think around August or September. In fact, just before... No, it was just before the first TV trials that we did last year in, in October. So, probably late September this chap was born. And so I'm pretty sure 
Seems he's probably weaned completely by now. He will certainly be spending a lot of time with his mother still, but they stay more in visual contact, so he won't need to be quite so close to her at the moment because he's a bit bigger and he can see her. Safa in New York City. Um, you, you want to know? I'm just laughing that you were Safa in New York City. That must be quite a trial. Um, beautiful city, though, that it is. You want to know whether there are any prides in this area that specialise in giraffe killing. Um, so you're obviously quite astute and you know about lions. Some prides absolutely do. Um, I don't know of any at the moment in this particular area that are doing particularly specialist giraffe uh, murdering. But certainly there are, they are around. You want to know if the Mapoho coalition used to kill giraffe. They did sometimes. And certainly when I was working at Andalosi and the Mapoho were around, and the giraffe, some, they used to chase the giraffe down into the Sand River and they'd slip and fall over and then find themselves devoured fairly quickly. But I haven't seen a giraffe kill here, I don't think. Brian, you must have seen them. You haven't. Uh, okay, so lions here, not so much. I think there seems to be a great specialization in buffalo killing around here. I'm just going to go forward. I can hear a... I also want to show you the sunrise coming up with the bar. Hello, Brian Jürgensen. Nice to hear from you this morning. I want to know if you heard a go-away bird calling. Uh, yes, definitely. You would have heard a go-away bird calling. Okay. The sunrise is very pretty, I was not sure. Scott has got a better view of the sunrise, so let's head across to him and get an update on what his plans are and a good look of the sun. See you just now. Hello, and look at this for a sunset, sunrise, sunset, I almost said. Been a shaky start to the morning for me. And I guess that's because of the wonderful cool weather last night. It was so easy to sleep for a change because we weren't melting in bed. So well rested and really looking forward to the bush walk slash bush drive. And we are combining the two to try and be as effective as possible. And the reason why we can possibly be, be more effective by starting in the vehicle is we can cover more ground, try and find some fresh tracks of lion or leopard, and then get onto their trail and follow them. So that's the goal for this morning. It could well work out that we don't find any tracks after about half an hour or 45 minutes. And then we may just decide to go and walk in, a, in, an, in an area and see what we can find, possibly some smaller things, the insects, and that is the beauty of being on a bush walk. You get to see a lot of the smaller animals, creatures and things that are quite easy to overlook in the vehicle. So that's what we're looking forward to. We've got Andrew on camera. He's gonna be jumping around the vehicle that we are now to try and get you the best possible shots. And let's hope he doesn't go tumbling off. And we're gonna carry on now. Happy to hear that you guys started with the giraffe. Can I help you there, Andrew? There we go. And the plan initially is to head south along this road that runs kind of from the center of Juma to our southern boundary. And then we're going to be checking the southern boundary up to the eastern boundary called Cheetah Cut Line. And the reason why we would like to check that eastern boundary is the Inkahuma Pride of Lioness that are fragmented ever so slightly. Some of them are with the Birmingham boys and others are with uh, just three lionesses we've seen yesterday afternoon. But they were in that general area. So we're going to just double check and make sure that they haven't come back for a visit. The good news is we've also got Steph who's just behind us 
that's there and he's going to be an extra set of eyes and ears and also make sure that we return home safely from the possible dangers on this bushwalk so that's the bushwalk team for this morning and we are really looking forward to the adventure that awaits us we're going to send you back to james and hopefully the next time you see us we'll be on the trail of something like a lion or a leopard Right, well, we're sitting here looking at the sun as well, simply because it is too magnificent not to be looking at, hoping that it will be gentle on us today and just uh, perhaps hide behind a few clouds. A very pleasantly cool breeze blowing out of the south at the moment. You can see the clouds highing their way across the sky there. Really is very spectacular indeed. I'll just tell you what we can hear. Let's listen for 20 seconds. So, as per has been pretty normal at this, you know, for the summer and the drought, not a very loud dawn chorus. A couple of doves, the ubiquitous woodland kingfisher, couple of grey-headed sparrows going choop, 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 choop. A couple of Franklins, but otherwise it's not, it's not what you'd expect of a kind of subtropical summer's morning. So definitely the drought taking its toll on the animals here, and I'm just looking at the ground around here and seeing how wet it is. I think we've probably only got about two or three millimetres of rain last night, which is, I mean, an inch is 25 millimetres or 24 and a half millimetres. So really not a lot of rain. The incredibly state-of-the-art weather station that we have here uh, sent me an email this morning that told me that we didn't get any rain. Uh, it tells me that seemingly whether there is rain or not. Oh, that's pretty. Look at that, everyone. That fills the soil, the soul with joy. Junebug, an interesting question, and I don't know the answer. We certainly, uh, well, let me give you a question first. You want to know if we get ozone warnings here. I mean, I don't know what an ozone warning is. Apparently, you get them in Texas. Um, but I will say to you that, as I have said, Brian and I have found this summer to be much brighter than any other summer we've ever experienced. And I'm just not sure whether that has something to do with the a lack of ozone, perhaps. I've certainly never been burned by the sun after sort of half past four or five o'clock in the afternoon, and this year I most certainly have. And. Yeah, maybe there is a depletion of some sort of ozone um, and maybe that's what that brightness and the sort of extra burning sun is. I'm not sure, but we don't get warnings here. Perhaps we should. Thanks, Junebug. That's actually fascinating. That is uh, almost post-apocalyptic, isn't it, Brian? Mm. British Columbia and Canada and you've been reading Kipling, which everybody should do, I suppose, at least once in their lives, and you're reading his Just So stories, and you <laughs> you say that it's wonderful to read about these uh, those animals, and now, you, of course, you could picture most of them here on safari with us. And you say he makes mention of the kolo kolo bird, and could I tell you what that is? Uh, no, I couldn't tell you what that is, Only I've got absolutely no idea at all. Brian, kolo kolo bird? <laughs> Um, kolo, 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 kolo. Kolo, 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 kolo. Uh, it might be a hornbill, perhaps, a hornbill. I'm assuming it's some sort of onomatopoeic name. Um, so if we go, kolo, 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 Well, that would be, um, that, the most obvious candidate would be a hornbill. So perhaps a hornbill. 
Um, I can't think really of what else it could possibly be. Yeah. Ah, Geraldine. Ah, Geraldine says it might not exist, uh, that it might just be from the story. That is her uh, sort of five minute desktop research there. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I think, quite interestingly, uh, we could just make it the, the hornbill if we wanted to. I'm very happy to call it that, Annie. Ooh. Right. Okay, I'm just going to remove my GoPro camera now from the dashboard. It has done a time lapse of this magnificent sun. Oof, that is just spectacular. But again, very, very bright. If you're not staring at it with the advantage of the filter on the camera. Right, let's go and have a look down there. I see two young Impala having a little bit of a boxing match. It's quite interesting. And then we'll carry on and see if we can't find some large, large animals. Steph and I come out here all the day and uh, we sort of do our little exercises around this tree. But it has been uh, rubbed extensively by elephants since our last visit. And it smells quite as strongly of elephant dung, uh, urine around here. And so I'd really appreciate it if they didn't sort of leave the equipment around the place. They've, they've rubbed on all the equipment, they've, they've dropped bits of pieces of silver cluster leaf all over the, all over the gym floor. It's very really unkind of them. Anyway, the silver cluster leaves are taking a bit of a hammering at the moment. Now, anyway, the question from uh, Linda in New York is, uh, do my family watch this very much, A, and B, what do they think of my antics? Well, first of all, they don't watch it a huge amount, mainly because the internet connection where they live in the Eastern Cape, this is my mother and father, uh, doesn't work very well. Uh, my brother sometimes watches, I think, with his young nephew, and my sister is in England, and she does sometimes watch, but not religiously. Um, as for my antics, I think that they're probably quite sick of them by now. They've had them since I was born. And so they kind of roll their eyes heavenward every so often. Here we have two of them having a little sparring match. One having his morning constitutional. It's quite interesting. I mean, we're not, we're on, fe we're in February, obviously. Uh, the rutting season will only probably start in about April. But these little chaps will just be testing each other out there now. They're certainly not going to be breathing this year. They're much too young for that. You can see two generations there. Those two, or those two, are those two are the same age. And just sorting out little dominant hierarchies, testing each other out like young teenagers. And those two are of an, oh, there's lots of lots of boxing going on here. Let me try and roll forward. No, I think it doesn't roll. I don't want to frighten them. So there, there are two-year-olds and one-year-olds in this group, and they don't seem to be fighting intergenerationally. They're only fighting sort of within their own generation, within their own cohort. So those are two two-year-olds having a little box. I mean, that's, that's vicious stuff, you know. I mean, that, that, I'm sure you can hear it. But the protection on the skull must be quite something. So a question, a very good question, in fact, which I should have possibly explained. Um, how do you tell 
what season they're from and how old they are. Well, I mean, the general thing is that once a, a an impala is over two, they've got those two sort of turns in their horns, like those two that you're looking at there. Now, those are not very big horns, and they're pretty, not very big impala, and so I'm guessing that they turn two in November. I think that's pretty accurate. The others, of course, the yearlings, don't have two turns in their horns, just that one sort of curve. The horns still curve towards each other, and that's how I tell that they were born in November, not last year, but the year before in 2014. The new ones, born in November this year, will just start to have little protuberances coming out of their, of their uh, heads. Females, I couldn't tell you the difference. Unless I saw them standing next to each other, then it might be quite obvious. Well, I mean, that's quite, a, that's quite an angry fight. And of course, as we go into the rut, which will probably begin, like I say, early March, they start to sort each other out. And then they'll only breed in May. Then the fights do become a lot more vicious than they are now. Twitter, and you want to know when, how old these antelope are when they start to get their horns. I mean, it does vary from antelope to antelope. I think you'll find that these impala start up, I forget exactly, but you'll probably find around about now, so about four months. Three to four months they will start to develop horns. That fence in the background leads to the final control and also the, the owner's pad, Yuri's pad. The inviting swimming pool that he has, not to this morning, but uh, on a hot day. Not that I've ever swum there. Now, Alston. You, one of our young viewers, lovely to hear from you. You want to know what birds you can hear in the background. It is a little bit louder than it was when we stopped to listen earlier on. So let's listen for 20 seconds. I suppose would be the woodland kingfisher. You can hear it going. And one day they will disappear. One day, not too far from now, they will um, head back north, and and then it will suddenly be silent. There we go. Some hardy dars. Well done, Brian. Lovely hardy dars. Um, always a slightly amusing sound to hear, unless you wake up um, after a big night out in the morning, then they're very unpleasant to hear. And what else did we have? We had some kolo kolo birds, some hornbills going one or two franklins, some doves. But otherwise, not a huge amount of noise. Okay, we're going to head down towards the Juma Dam and then probably think about going towards Arethusa and see what they've got going on that side of the world. Um, in the meantime, uh, let's head across to... Sorry, there was just a... Those Impala were doing that stotting thing that they do, which is very amusing. Anyway, let's head across to Scott. He's on the Cheetah Cut Line. I will see you in a little while. And I hope you enjoyed my impersonation of the needle bill duck or hardy da. <laughs> and well done again to all of you who've been sending through the various calls of the African wilderness, an initiative started by Brent. And I think it's a great one that we all get to laugh at one another making these funny noises. 
We thought we'd call you across to Cheetah Cut Line. This is our eastern boundary. This is where we are hoping to find some tracks of the Inkohuma Lioness. And who knows, maybe even some of the Birmingham boys will follow them back to Juma. They've been skipping a beat, not coming onto this area, making sure that there's no other males snooping around here. So I'm hoping that because it's a long time overdue, the little bit of moisture we got last night may cause them to change tune and come across to Juma, do some scent marking and establish that there are in fact no intruders. And it's something that male lions do need to do, especially a coalition like the Birmingham boys who have established quite a large territory in quite a short space of time. And what you'll often find is that they'll split up into smaller groups, maybe out of the five Birmingham's, a group of two and a group of three. And that way, one, can, one group can patrol the northern area and another can patrol the southern, for example. So that's something that we can expect to see happening. And because it's overdue, like I say, hopefully sooner rather than later. The nice thing about this road is that it's very sandy. So it's quite easy to see the tracks of animals that have walked along it. And there's some large tracks there that look to be hippo that have been walking down the road last night. So there've been some hippo moving through this area. And what's nice about driving down a road that's easy to see tracks in is that once you've done it, you can feel confident that you haven't in fact missed any tracks, which is, often not the case on many of the roads that do become quite hard and difficult to see the tracks on. Other animals we could expect to see in this area in terms of predators, Mvula, a big male leopard, and this is just about as far west as he comes. He just sneaks into our eastern boundary, whereas he used to occupy the whole of Juma, and now he's moved further to the east thanks to Tingana, the big male leopard we saw yesterday. James Richards. Hope all is well with you. And you're interested to know whether predators and any of the big cats will have any preferences in terms of what they may hunt. And it's a preference that you say specifically relating to taste. And I find that highly, highly unlikely. Other guides may disagree, but as far as I'm aware, predators will eat just about most kinds of meat or most kinds of prey that they can bring down. A few interesting ones, a bush pig apparently is not preferred diet of lions. So even though they may kill a bush pig for sport, they technically don't like to feed on them very much. And there's one other that I think I'm forgetting, but in general, lions and leopards will feed on just about anything that they can catch um, as a general rule. Now, what you may find, James, is that in certain areas, lions, especially lions, may specialize in hunting certain prey. Maybe it's giraffe or maybe it's elephant, so really unique prey. Um, and that's specifically because there may not be too much other prey in the area, or it may be because they're a super pride, a monstrous pride of lion that have got a lot of mouths to feed. So it's always more about quantity as opposed to quality, really, and they'll specialize in hunting, like I said, big prey for a big pride or, or, or possibly something that's numerous. You know, if one animal is more numerous, one prey species is more numerous than others, it may make sense for any of the predators to really focus on learning to hunt them. But I guess that happens through default, really, because if they're the most plentiful, that's what they're going to have the most opportunities to focus on hunting. Now there, there are going to be, again, slight, uh, slight possible preferences and specialities of certain predators. We've noticed that Quarantine, a young male leopard, has become quite a, uh, a professional kudu hunter. Now whether that's through default or whether we've just got lucky enough to see him with those specific kills, I'm not too sure. But you might find that is a kind of prey species that's maybe a little bit big on average for leopard, but it's something that he's willing to take the risk on taking down. You'll also find that big male leopards, for example, can adopt quite lazy hunting strategies where they'll lie in ambush like Tingana. We assume he probably was lying on top of a termite mound yesterday, waiting for the warthog that he caught yesterday morning to run out. And we know he does the same thing with aardvark and their burrow. So he's become a specialist in hunting animals that need to exit their burrow at some point where he's lying in ambush. And not necessarily just him, I've noticed that with quite a few male leopards, like I said, adopting a slightly more lazy hunting strategy, which affords them hours and hours of rest while they wait for their prey to exit 
their various burrows. This road is often a highway for lion and leopard. It's called Central Road and sadly today no very fresh tracks but what I am going to do quickly is just jump out and show you the effect that the rain has and then how much easier it would be to see tracks even where I'm walking here you can probably see fairly clearly and then if I put my hand down it's already dried up completely so not as effective as I was hoping it to be but you can see that it's going to be quite easy to pick up tracks Okay, well we've just got about another quarter of a mile, half a mile or so of cheetah cut line and once we've got to the end of cheetah cut line to our northern boundary we're then going to jump off and probably do a walk from there unless of course James manages to find some tracks or anyone manages to find some tracks between now and then So one thing that we haven't managed to do with you guys yet live is track down some lions on foot so that's something that I'm really looking forward to doing and it's going to happen one day we've got leopard on foot James had those wild dog on foot just the other day it's just lion we're missing some sightings with Lucy in Indiana, you are right, Andrew is enjoying the long cable which affords him free reign of the vehicle and he clambers around like a little spider monkey in order to get the best shots and I guess like most things in life a bit of a change of scenery is always good fun and we've all enjoyed the new angles and new new takes that you guys get from the vehicle. I think we are in luck here. Andrew, look down on your side of the vehicle there. What are those tracks? Not too sure. But yes, Lucy, you are spot on. I may have driven over all of the tracks. I know. It's just a hyena here that I can see. There are also lion tracks here, but they are from before the rain heading in your direction. So from very, very early last night, I'm guessing it's those Inkohuma lioness that you guys saw with James. And even though these tracks aren't very clear, aren't very easy to see, I think we may jump off here and try and establish exactly where they've gone so i think this may be the starting point of our walk so we're going to need to send you back to james while we get rigged up and change andrew's long cable to the short cable which is better suited to the walk and we'll give you an update as soon as we've worked out what's going on here cool we're gonna send you to James right now and it's going to be some perfect timing as he is arriving at the hyena den. Let's hope it's active. Hyena, hyena everybody, there's a hyena walking through, following it in towards the den. Hopefully it's madam and she's going to bring out her tiny little babies for me to see. I have yet to see them and I think given the amount of time I've spent with trying to see them, I feel it's time she rewarded me. Maggie, I think you in Vancouver were war war wanting to know if there is any activity here. Well, there you may have just seen a hyena flitting across the front of the vehicle. I'm not sure if that flitting is a particularly good verb to describe a hyena.
I fear me you won't be. I don't see any cubs. I don't see any adults. I see nothing. There's a termite mound. No. Nothing going on here, I'm afraid, everybody. Let's sit for just two minutes. It looks very pretty with the sun coming up behind it. I'm not sure why that female would have come so close and then turned. Lovely smell of petrichor here. Just infinitely better than the smell of hyena dung. And there, Austin, you were asking about birds and what we can hear. There's a rattling cysticular calling. But not much in the way of hyenas here. I can also hear a black crown chagra. It's actually much louder here. The black crown chagra goes. <whistles> laughing doves. <whistles> you might also be able to hear the tap, tap, tapping of a bearded woodpecker. Massachusetts and you've been keeping a bird list for a year now um, you say you don't watch every day three or four drives a week I still think that's quite a lot thank you for your time Michelle and you say you've got 120 birds on your list which I think is a good amount and you say can you stop now um, <laughs> no you may not stop Michelle you will carry on please writing down all the birds that you see is very important uh, do not stop your bird list, Michelle. You have to catch up with Mike in Florida, who has got um, 200 and something birds. 225. 225 birds. So, no, Michelle, afraid not. You just keep going. But thank you for watching and thank you for keeping a list. All right, no hyenas here. Let's get out of here and go and see if we can find some lions or leopards. <laughs> I actually thought about that. Any chance that the hyenas have moved to another den during the night? Um, yeah, there's a chance. I think it's unlikely. Uh, that said, I mean, there's no one here. I think it's very unlikely, though. And that hyena, that adult did come down here and then sort of walk off, and I suspect it's probably just gone to sleep over there. Um, yeah, I'm going to say no, I don't think they have. It's not impossible, though, do you think? Lustry night last night. It would have been a, I think it would have been a strange night to choose um, if they were going to move last night because obviously even if you're a hyena and you have these super senses, you it's it's not easy to. Oh, little Franklins. They've just made it through the really difficult part of being a tiny Franklin chick, and they've uh, fledged. If a ground bird is able to fledge just got their adult coloration and they're actually looking they on their way to adulthood so they've made it through the most difficult time little baby crested franklins and look how beautiful their colors are they're so overlooked half the time and those little white stripes really do sort of glow in the early sun
and they will go and fosk about in elephant dung and around the grass and they will look for seeds and insects mainly probably you know they'll take whatever they can get at the moment so few insects around because of the lack of rain and so few seeds for the same reason all right scott has got some pug marks that he'd like to show you so let's head across to him and i will see you hopefully with some tracks of my own in just a little while sound there for Scott, sorry about that, um, I'm sure he will fixing whatever it is that needs to be fixed, and um, we'll be back with you on Bushwalk soon. That, Pat did that to me the other day as well, a few times, while we were trying to watch uh, wild dogs on foot, and um, it's actually quite amusing, if you, I don't know if you were watching a few days ago, but Andrew and I had them, and Steph had the most fantastic experience, I think, of my bush life with wild dogs that came to within sort of three meters of us while we were sitting on the side of the road, and the camera would not film them. It would not turn on and broadcast to the final control. So while they were coming down the road, um, the dogs were coming down the road towards us and Andrew was sat primed, ready to film them and I was now playing techie, trying to fix the backpack and make sure that it worked. And I thought I'd been relatively controlled about this whole situation and Andrew was, so he was recording onto the camera but we couldn't get the picture out from the backpack to the final control and therefore to you. And on re-watching the footage when we got back home, um, on uh, re-watching the footage it seemed that I hadn't been at all controlled and we are certainly going to have to do some very serious editing of the sound if we ever put pictures of that thing up. Um, the language I used was less than tasteful um, but then of course as Scott's camera flicked onto us I sat down and I was smiling and waving because that's what you have to do. <laughs> I was quite shocked at myself actually. Wonderful, wonderful experience. That's why we live out here for experiences like that. And Jeffrey, you say we may as well check the other dens to see if the hyenas have gone there. Yes, I think we will probably do that during the course of the day. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to go there right now. It might be worth just finding out what's going on in Arethusa, I think. Just in case there's something phenomenal. If there isn't, then I think we, we may come back and do precisely that. Um, and if they have moved, they could move to various places, and Deborah, you want to know if they'd go back to the same den. Uh, Deborah, normally they can go back to, you know, they'll have a number of dens within their territories that they do reuse. So I know of at least five that we have around here, six actually, and they could use any of them. And if they find another suitable spot within the territory, they'll use that too.
those lions have gone. Let's go and get an update on Arethusa, see what's happening there, and then we'll come back. Gracious me, sorry about that. sights on. Cindy, you are in North Carolina. Ah, oh, it is a Wahlberg's eagle. This can be seen at this distance simply by its size, and if it lifts its head, you'll see the tiny little crest on the back of its head. There, there, that little pointy bit on the top, completely indicative of a Wahlberg's eagle. Cindy, you want to know if I ever go stargazing during the night? Um, sometimes I do. Uh, sometimes we all do. And the stars are very magnificent out here, I must say. And it's a pity that our cameras are not quite sophisticated enough to be able to show you the stars at night. They aren't really, Brian. Hey, you can't... No, not really. Not really. I think we're, we're getting there. We're nearly at a point where we could actually show you the magnificent skies of the southern hemisphere and you say you'd love to see the southern hemisphere stars well i hope you're able to at some stage during your, your life cindy um if you want to see some of the southern hemisphere stars like the southern cross and you don't want to leave the united states well you can pop across to hawaii and that apparently is the only american state where the southern cross is visible on the Biffles Hook cut line, so I'm going to drive quite slowly. This is our northern boundary, for those of you who don't know. And so I'm going to drive gently along here and just see if there are any tracks. Uh, the freshness of the rain is quite nice in that uh, any tracks that you do see are probably going to be fresh. They do make tracking slightly difficult, though, because of the crust that forms on top of, of the sort of dirt. And so the animal that has walked along here generally has to be relatively heavy in order for you to see tracks. A hyena has definitely walked along here. Um, let's see if I can find you a little pug mark of a hyena. There you can sort of see them walking along the side of the road there. You get them there, Brian. There. Those are hyena tracks there that have walked along the side of the road. Not a great example. Where a better example I'll get out and show you nicely. Anyway. in Orlando, Florida. You want, to, you want to know if we ever play music uh, in the evening in camp and if the animals are attracted or perhaps repelled by such music. We do play quite a lot of music. Um, and I don't know how the animals react to it. Certainly, I mean, Brian and I have found ourselves, you know, in a sort of lion sighting where the lions are fast asleep doing nothing at all and we've been waiting for a link across. And Brian, of course, is a very competent and we find ourselves making up little ditties as we go along. And it often does elicit a bit of a response. It's not a, uh, an obvious one, there, but they'll lift their heads and look every so often like that and then put them back to sleep. So yes, they do respond, but I don't think that the, the animals are necessarily attracted or repelled by the sound of gentle music. Uh, I'm sure they would be by the sound of very loud music. And that would be a bit of a rough way. Okay, Scott's got something interesting to show you, uh, something with many legs, and we'll continue towards Arethusa to see there. Oh, how was that for timing? Uh, I'm not too sure 
why it decided to curl up like that all of a sudden. Maybe it's because all of you guys joined us and a couple of thousand people made it get a little bit of strange fright. Interestingly enough, this millipede is busy feeding on some old rabbit poop for breakfast and there's a tiny little piece here that I can maybe use to show you what it is feeding on. It's going to uncurl itself shortly. So I've broken it up here and you can kind of see the fine grassy fibers of rabbit poop. It's interesting, it's quite wet um, from the rain last night, but what would usually happen is if you were to break this up, it would be a very good indicator for which direction the wind's blowing in. But now it's not doing that because it's wet, of course. And it's almost come alive from that moisture. It's looking a little bit green, you could say. It's got its own little ball of rabbit dung that it's busy feeding on. And difficult to see now. I'm sure it's going to uncurl itself shortly. And that's their defense mechanism, along with the fact that they are laced with traces of a cyanide-like toxin that makes them very distasteful and poisonous, I guess, to most animals. But a few animals will feed on them, mainly scorpions and civets. And there you might be able to see its legs and its mouthpiece working that piece of rabbit dung. How incredible is this? And I guess with all of those legs, it's not very easy for you to see the dung. But it's in there and it's completely encased that little dropping. And a good example of how important all these smaller creatures are in the ecosystem, in the environment, for recycling nutrients back into the ecosystem. That little ball of elephant dung, oh, sorry, uh, rabbit dung, would have, yes, eventually over time been weathered away and broken down and become reusable to the plants. You need to absorb all those nutrients back into the ecosystem. But what this decomposer is doing is it's simply speeding up that process and it's making it a far more effective system. Let's just see if it doesn't uncurl itself now. I'm hoping you're going to see that little ball of rabbit dung. I've actually never seen them doing that, and it's quite an awesome thing to, to notice. It's a first for me, and now I know if I ever find a millipede that, that's looking a little bit hungry, rabbit dung is the way forward, or maybe it's just a breakfast delicacy, who knows. Cool, well, we're going to carry on earlier. I couldn't explain to you what I was doing because there's no audio, but there were some lion tracks and it wasn't very clear to see them. And that's because the rain had fall, fell on top of them and kind of diffused the crispness of them. But I did circle the pad, the toes, and they were heading in a southerly direction. We've searched around and couldn't work out whether they came onto Juma or off Juma. But we're going to walk around this general area and keep checking. I heard a squirrel alarm call just once though, up to our right, so I'm going to keep that in the memory bank. I'm not going to rush over there because if they were lion or leopard, you'd probably find that the squirrel would continue to alarm call as opposed to just let off one call. More likely a once-off call will be for a bird of prey flying over or possibly a false alarm. Good. Now it's a little bit windy. I've got my ash bag out and if any of you are joining for your first bushwalk, this is a very important tool that I like to use and it just gives you an idea of where the wind's blowing. And obviously if you know which way the wind's blowing, you'll know where the animals will smell you before we see them or get close to them. And it's just a very important way of keeping safe. We're going to move slowly, stopping and listening, making sure we don't put any animals in a situation where they feel threatened because both of the outcomes of that scenario would be something we don't want. They would either run away or run towards us. Hi there, Mike in Florida, and you're interested to know if millipedes are ever fed on by humans. But like I said, because of those traces of cyanide within their bodily fluids, or cyanide-like toxin at least, they are poisonous to most creatures. And the only ones that I know of that can feed on them are millipede, uh, sorry, scorpions, as well as the civet, the African civet, which is an animal that I don't think we've ever actually managed to show you on camera. They're highly nocturnal in this area. 
but hopefully we'll be able to find a civetry, which is a spot where civets like to go to the toilets, almost like an internet cafe, you could say. And it's in these deposits that you often find a lot of rings from the millipede's body, and also outside scorpion burrows, which we will be able to find, again, some leftover debris from the millipedes. I wonder if you can hear that commotion going on there. It's some Schlegabafazis, some cackling sisters, also known as green wood hoopies. Let's see if we can find them. They're such pretty birds, and with this little camera, we might be able to get you up close and personal to them. Now, I've been caught out and been a little bit naughty and T. Van Dijk, thank you for catching me out. Um, I was saying rabbit poop. It's in fact not rabbits that we, we get you. They are hares, scrub hares. So that was naughty of me, bad guiding. And there is a difference between rabbits and hares. And the main differences are that rabbits live underground and in burrows, whereas hares live in small scrapes just hiding under bushes. That's one of the major differences. There are a couple of others, but I'll leave that for you guys to research. I think the Cackling Sisters may have dodged us and flown off. Haven't heard any further sign of them. Obviously just a little bit too far away, but that happens with the birds. Hi there, Paul Rizzo, and while on the bushwalk, it's a great time to find the smaller things, and Paul's inquiring about golden orbweb spiders, and have we seen any? I think a handful may have been seen, Paul, but not nearly as many as last summer. Usually they're everywhere, and they get really big. Legs and all, they're about that size, for those of you who don't know what a golden orbweb spider looks like. But I guess it's the drought conditions, less insects around, less favorable hunting conditions for the spiders. And maybe that's why we haven't been noticing. Maybe they haven't grown as quickly as they normally would. Obviously less prey, less food, and they do grow seasonally. So they'll hatch as eggs tiny in the beginning of the summer and then slowly grow over time into a much bigger animal, depending again on how much food that they catch. Speaking of spiders, though, I can see a small little web here. And let's try and work out what's going on here. This looks like it could be a, a tent web spider of sorts, or maybe a crab spider, but I can't see where it is. I just want to see if I can't jiggle one of the branches and maybe they sometimes hide under a leaf or two. But no evidence of where this one could be hiding. It may be where this little spider could be but again maybe just the wrong conditions for favorable spider spider viewing but usually Paul there are golden orbwebs all over the shows they're not sure where they are we saw a garden orbweb spider of a decent size a couple of months ago and that kind of surprised me because usually the garden orbweb spiders aren't as common as the golden orbweb spiders so not too sure what's going on there but I can strongly feel that it's got to do with the drought. Good point that's just been brought up from Brian Jachensen and you're interested to know if millipedes can be eaten by an animal called a meerkat, so another animal that can feed on them. Quite possibly but I haven't spent much time with meerkats. Andrew has though, and he is shaking his head this way. So sorry, Brian, that's a no from Andrew. And Andrew is the meerkat specialist after having spent time in the Kalahari, running after them, filming them. Yes, jackpots. This is what you want to find on a walk. And just go slowly here, Andrew, because I'm worried it may get scared of us. 
Um, it's a giant African land snail and it is highly mobile as you can see. Those two long stalks, bless you, bless you Andrew. And obviously the snail didn't like the sound of Andrew sneezing. Incredible though to, to work out that they respond so quickly to noise. And watch it now as it defends itself by seeking refuge in that shell. Fascinating. And this is one animal that I did expect to see out and about after the rain. They need a bit of moisture to move around. Without moisture, they'll obviously desiccate quite quickly. So, favorable conditions for snail viewing. Oh, well, interesting stuff here, Andrew. This is going to be a tough one for you to get around. Apparently, Barbara's just posted a picture of a meerkat eating a millipede. Photoshop. Photoshop, apparently, Barbara. <laughs> Is Andrew's defense mechanism here. The snail goes into its shell and the cameraman claims Photoshop is conning you. <laughs> um, so interesting stuff. Maybe, uh, maybe in certain areas a, a very specific millipede can be fed on Barbara. But like I said, Andrew did spend a lot of time with them in the Kalahari. Were there millipedes there that you yeah. saw them ignore? Yeah, plenty. Most of them they just ran right past. Okay. Thanks. So that's really interesting and, and, and that's the wonderful thing about nature and about being on Safari Live's vehicle. There are so many of us that are together on this experience and can share different knowledge and stories and the important thing to remember with wild animals is that they may behave very differently in different parts of Africa and all the world. So the same species occurring in different areas will act differently. Look at it sticking out its eyes to check us out on those long stalks. Imagine if we could do that. As I was saying, and as Andrew said, you may have not heard him clearly, Barbara and Brian and everyone else, is that they saw lots and lots of millipedes there while they were filming the meerkats, and he said the meerkats would just go running straight past them, and not one or two. He said there was loads of millipedes in the Kalahari, and obviously they, you know, they noticed that it wasn't a food source. It's, it's such a slow-moving animal, and understandably slow moving animals need to have some kind of a defense mechanism in this case for the the millipedes it's their their toxic taste so it'll be interesting to work out what's what here we go now it's getting more confidence its eyes sticking out and just like the millipede we saw earlier this is also decomposed this is a very important animal when it comes to breaking down nutrients that can no longer be broken down by most other animals. So they specialized decomposes these. And let's hope that just like the millipede found its breakfast earlier, that the snail will also be able to find some breakfast soon. It's absolutely phenomenal how they can move their shell through this kind of terrain. I mean Imagine, this is some serious off-roading and often we as humans can take it for granted how easy our lives are when you take a look at what the snail's having to go through right here you get an idea of just how awesome all the different critters are perfect morning sunlight bathing its body This is fantastic. Great work there on camera, Andrew. Not easy to do what he's doing, free holding the camera. He's got a big backpack on, antenna pole sticking out, but still bringing you guys some wonderful, wonderful images. Okay, well, I think we can continue on now and see what else is lurking about here. I want to try and get onto Central Road, which is the road we checked a little bit earlier with you guys on the vehicle, and just see if we can't find any sign of where these lines may cross. It's so difficult to 
work out where they've been moving when they leave the roads because the ground is often quite hard. So I want to check that road carefully and hopefully we'll find some indications as to which direction they've moved in. We're going to send you back to James for an update on what he's up to and catch up with you all a little bit later. <clears throat> Well, we haven't made it to Arethusa yet. We're all sort of on our way still, but we stopped here next to some impala where the dawn chorus, well, it's not so much dawn anymore, but it's a lot more lively. Some doves and franklins and magpie shrikes, the odd canary. Now, Chris, you're in New York, and you say you've just seen a picture of a female impala with horns. And how unusual is this? It's extremely unusual. It's not impossible. We had a question the other day about, a, about lionesses that have manes every so often, and that does happen, and probably about the same frequency with which impala females have horns. Brian, there's something on top of that tree there. There's the canary. It's a yellow-fronted canary, uh, which I'm not sure you can actually see any yellow colour there, but beautiful yellow front, obviously, that's why it's called yellow-fronted, and yellow eye stripe, and then when it flies, this beautiful golden rump. But where it's sitting now, it looks fairly nondescript. on the ground there, looking for seeds. I don't know if you can see it there, Brian. You um, you got it. There you go. And he's eating the yellow flowers of the wandering Jew. Melina Africana, I think that one is. Hmm. Very nice, very nice. Okay, we're not too far from Arethusa, like I say, so let's pop along there and see what we can find. The temperature has remained mostly cool. I can say chilly in some respects. The sun is still bright. how bright the sun gets. Hello, Ben. You are just 14 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and a very good question. You want to know if I've ever seen Impala actually hurt each other. Uh, ben, I, I can't remember a time where I've seen severe injuries. I've definitely seen uh, injuries as a result of fights, you know, cut off that horn, that impala the other day, and I don't know if it's been seen for the last little while, with an, an eye that was a sort of glassy and had definitely been hurt in a fight. So they can hurt each other, Ben. I've never seen a severe injury. The antelope out here that cause themselves the most harm during fights are out here in this particular area are probably waterbuck. Apparently they will regularly create a death when they have horrible fights. And obviously their horns are designed for stabbing as opposed to interlocking and moving. Oops. Nearly a side wall. I'm going to, there's going to be a snake there. Snake or baby. 
Maybe it's those mongoose there. But you can hear them shouting, you can hear them. Rollers yelling. There are doves here. There are lapwings. Magpie shrikes. It's normally the kind of noise they'd make if they'd seen a snake, but I suspect what it is is a little dwarf mongoose that has just come out of their burrow to sun themselves. There they are. There. All right. Let's head across to Scott. He's got a little reptile to show you. Well, Angie in Wisconsin, you wouldn't believe how much luck we are in this morning. We just got your question wanting to know what kind of geckos do we find in this part of Africa? And you find many different species, but one of the most common and one of the biggest ones that we get to see here is the Turner's thick-toed or Turner's tubercled gecko and you wouldn't believe it. There's one right here. I literally stopped in this spot to get my phone out to show you a picture of this gecko. Now, Andrew's just getting into a spot there. It's just at the entrance to this little hole, and I don't know if it will help if I shine my flashlight on it. Might illuminate it a little bit better for Andrew. But that's a little babies. It's probably only about an inch and a half long. So it's a very small little Turner's tubercled or thick-toed gecko. They get to be quite large, about six inches in length, and a very chunky gecko. But many different types of gecko. You get some day geckos out here as well. I wonder what lives down in that burrow. It could be a excavation for some dwarf mongooses. I'm not too sure. But you can see the gecko waiting right at the entrance there. And now Andrew's just repositioned, hopefully getting you some even better shots, even better close-ups. I think there's a spider that you can also see there. I can't see it. And isn't that fascinating that you guys sitting at home can often see <clears throat> better than we can actually see sitting right here. And imagine we saw this gecko gobble up that spider wherever it is, it's possible. You can see a little cricket running around deep down in that burrow, but it all depends on the angle you're looking at. Anyway, this is the Turner's tubercle gecko in Angie in Wisconsin. What a luck! What an absolute luck that we stopped in the spot, and there it was right there waiting for us to show you. It's interesting, its coloration will change a little bit as it gets bigger, and I do actually have a picture of an adult here, and it's really awesome to see. I'm not sure if Andrew's going to be able to zoom in on that but this is an adult it's about six inches long and it's got a big fat body big thick toes as well and those very prominent white spots which stick out on those little tubercles those little bumps on their body and like i say this uh this adult gecko will probably be about six inches about that long so quite big and quite chunky so possible or capable of tackling quite chunky prey awesome what a bonus and Angie keep asking for anything that you may desire to find because if our luck continues if you want to see a gecko and as the question comes through we find one then we might may as well continue riding the wave so put your next request through and let's see if we don't get lucky again so we've got onto the central road now. This is the road that I let you know we were coming to in the hope that we may find some lion tracks here, but nothing yet. We'll keep you updated if anything changes. Back to James. Okay, everybody, we're now pulling on to Arethusa. There aren't any updates. I have contacted them. Um, so let's go and see what we can find there. Maybe we will be lucky. Perhaps Tingana has gone back to his sort of home. Perhaps Shadow has uh, also had pubs. Hold on, 
tight, lift your drinks off your laps, otherwise you will spill them as we go over these bumps. Uh, uh, uh. And then one of the very first questions we had today, this morning, was about a go-away bird, and there's one in that tree there. You see it there? Right in the top. Now, obviously, hiding from us. strong smell of water back around here. No, I can definitely find you a better go-away bird than that. Certainly the ones that were going backwards tripped every so often. But you know, they are so fast and they are so their reaction speed is so high that you know even if they do sort of trip a little bit, they're never gonna fall over. I mean they'd really have to fall over a very large log in order for them to, to trip over properly. So um, I think I think you'd find that their the sensitivity in their feet and their movements is such that they're just able to avoid tripping far more than say you or I would be. And the uh, you can see my face screwing up as I turn to look at you because yeah that sun has just gone it's gone white hot already. Not in terms of the heat it's giving, but in terms of the, the light. We are now on Arethusa. You can see it's very different from all the other land that we drive on Juma. Not really. Hello, Kate in San Francisco. Um, I'm laughing because of what Scott is going to show you shortly. Um, you, you say that maybe the brightness has got to do with the dust. You used to live in L.A. where there's a lot of dust. Um, Kate, I think it's got to do with the lack of... Uh, there's not as much dust as there would be in winter here because the wind isn't as, as, hasn't been blowing around. And I also think there's very little moisture in the air at the moment, and I think that's not diffusing the light. And I think that's why it's so bright all the time. Okay, let's head across to Scott. He's got a small arachnid disease-bearing version thereof to show you. I'm going to continue into Arethusa. Well, we are hoping that you guys can see this tiny little pepper tick crawling around on my fingers here. It is my newt! And it's just on the edge of that shadow. Um, here we go. It's heading towards the stick. It's coming straight towards the end of the stick. It is minute. And this is called a pepper tick. We were just talking about them yesterday. I hope you guys have managed to get a little glimpse of it. But if you haven't, that emphasizes how small they are. And that's what we, we're trying to show you. Just how minute this little, little arachnid is. These are terrible, and Steph has been 
attacked by them. He's obviously walked through a nest of these pepper ticks. The interesting thing is they find Steph particularly tasty and he often gets attacked more heavily than the rest of us do. So it's always nice to have him on a walk because it allows the pepper ticks to focus on him and not us. And this was a kind donation from Steph, from him to you and there it goes, it's off me. He actually put, oh, there's another one crawling around my hand here. He gave me a few different specimens, but I'm gonna try and make sure that all of them are off me because they have got the most terrible little bites. And you only really realize that they're onto you once you they've started biting you. And there can be sometimes 30, 40, 50 of them that latch onto you. And they basically leave you with a bite that itches for two or three days. And it's super itchy that you scratch, 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 scratch until usually drawing blood and taking the head off that little uh, bite. So not a good one to be bitten by. And like I said, that's the joy of having Steph around on these bushwalks. They tend to target him and not us. But I did get caught out just the other day. I had about 50 of them on my legs all the way up to my stomach. And because they're so small, that's the other catch is that they're hard to pluck off because you can hardly see the things. The pepper tick. And we're just speaking about them yesterday. I would prefer to be taken by a big tick than one of those little ones. dropped Andrew in the deep end here. There's a Woodlands Kingfish, if you just cut, you got it there. So we're just gonna try and get you some views of this Woodlands Kingfisher. Give us a second here. Oh, great work. Looks like Andrew's onto it now. Just fine tuning it and it's such a brightly colored bird. One of our summer migrants. Chick is the call that they let out and it is another one of the absolutely beautiful birds here Andrew lost focus there for a second because the fly started biting him on the neck so do forgive him as he relieved himself <laughs> the joys of being a cameraman in the bush you get pestered and again I love it when those little things happen because it emphasizes how live and how real this whole experience is toodle do little kingfisher Wonderful. Sorry about that little bite on the back of your neck, Andrew. <laughs> I remember when I was on bushwalk camera and the flies were out in full force and you'd literally have them in your ear hole and you're trying to hold the shot steady. Not fun. So I can relate. I've done my time and all we can do is sympathize with poor old Andrew. <laughs> Quite a nice opportunity, Andrew. Maybe you can show your shadow there and you'll see the long antenna pole sticking up here and that's the bit of the backpack now that he went side profile friendly wave um, and that long antenna makes andrew's life a lot more difficult than mine and often when we're planning our routes we have to try and make sure that there's no overhanging branches that a cameraman gets caught in <laughs> Ah, Liz in Wisconsin, you would like to know a little bit more about exactly what I said with that little arachnid. And that was the word I used. It's not a spider, but it is an arachnid. So it's got eight legs and therefore it's not an insect. As are all the ticks in you, not all arachnids are actually spiders. You get some scorpions, which are also arachnids. So quite a few eight-legged insect-like animals of which the tickers won. So I was hoping at some point around this road junction we we're going to find some lion tracks but it's not looking hugely promising at this stage. Again difficult, the tracks may have been washed away by the rain. Ah Angie who I asked to send through her next request after the freaky gecko sighting that we've just had, freakishly lucky gecko sighting we had rather. And your next request, Angie, is a snake and I could think of nothing better than finding. So thank you for asking for that. Let's hope though that your requests come true. We'll be searching high and low and doing our best to find you that snake. But while we do that, we're gonna send you back to James. 
No, that's a turn up for the books, everyone. A young elephant bull here on Arethusa. And the most notable thing about him at the moment is that sort of weeping coming out of his temporal gland that's leaked almost into his mouth. So he's obviously a little bit stressed about something. Uh, we have no idea at this stage what it is. And there's just a huge amount of liquid there that's come out of that temporal gland. Now, you will drive around with various guides around the place, and those who uh, shouldn't perhaps be seeking other employment will tell you, and there are many of them, will tell you that that is a sign of must. And it isn't. It can be. It's a sign of some kind of stress. And a young bull like this, well, it's possible that it's must, yeah, that he could be coming into must, um, but it's more likely that it's some kind of stress to do with the drought. He's a young bull, perhaps he's been chased around a bit by an older bull, perhaps he's just been kicked out of the herd by his mother, and he's feeling lonely and vulnerable on his own. But some kind of stress has caused that streaming from his temporal gland, and he's enjoying a breakfast of Zizifus mucrenata, or the buffalo thorn. Beautiful, beautiful morning. Kingfisher's calling, and you can possibly hear that chup, 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 behind us of the tawny flanked prinia. But otherwise, it is the m most peaceful kind of a, a day. Of mind at a small flask of coffee to sit here and enjoy watching this elephant. Brian, we must do that one day. Oh, you don't drink coffee, do you, Brian? On the occasion. On the occasion. And the Zizifus, of course, has got very vicious thorns on it. it. Doesn't affect the elephant at all. And very tasty leaves, even for human beings. Very nice in a salad. Yesterday, I was in the process of showing you a brown ivory tree when I think Scott found something, so we had to go quickly across to him. Oh, he was with Tingana. That's right, Tingana was about to um, leap upon a kudu's back. And Polly, I think it's... Sorry, Nikki, can you go again with the name? I think it's Polly. Um, you want to know about a brown ivory tree and you'd like to take a picture of it. Absolutely, we'll, we will try and find one for you. And the brown ivory is called the Unkahuma tree in Shitsonga, and that was told to us by Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, in Ohio yesterday. And the Unkahuma pride takes its name from that tree, the brown ivory tree or the Unkahuma tree, and so I will try and find you one. In these um, drainage line areas, it's more the red ivory that we see but we could certainly find a Brian Ivory, and I know a very nice one on Juma. A very interesting question from Tom. Um, we are just struggling a little bit with the final control communications because we're in a hole here in Arethusa. Um, Tom, I'm not sure where you are, but do you want to know the odor or scent coming off the secretion in on the gland there from that elephant changes dependent on whether he's in must or not? I don't think so, Tom. I think you'll find the gland is fairly specific in the hormone that it produces. I suppose the odor might change in strength. I've, I've never noticed a smell actually from that, though. Um, from that temporal gland, but when they are in must, what smells... I'm just going to stop here. What smells, Tom, is the, um, the secretion coming from uh, the, the penis, which is a very smelly kind of uh, green urine, thick, greasy urine. 
and that smells very strong. Oh, he's lovely, isn't he great? Scott and Andrew apparently have something uh, jumping to show you, so let's go across there and hopefully this elephant will still be here. So we've just stumbled upon this elegant grasshopper and we've decided to do a count the colours with you guys because it has got so many awesome colours on it, it's fascinating. So let's start on the antenna, orange black. White on the face. Can we call those eyes red? I think yes, for this exercise we can. That's four. Greenish color on the back of its head. I'm going to just try and tilt it across to you a little bit. But it does have a greenish coloration towards the back of its head. That's five. Yellow also in that same area. Six. Blue, seven. So I've counted seven colors there may be a few more and isn't it the most remarkable looking insect what i love about them as well and most grasshoppers is that they've got these little spines on the back of their jumping legs and this is where their kind of defense comes in i guess it's defense as well as purchase when jumping out of long grass it'll give them a little bit of extra grip but if any little predators latch onto them they can kick out with these powerful back legs and you may notice the little spines on this bottom ridge here, where I'm pointing with the stick. Thankfully, they are not causing too much trouble in this area. Look at it trying to hide from Andrew. Are you camera shy, little grasshopper? I think it might be, but you must be getting some good views from wherever you are, but it definitely seems to be dodging Andrew. Well, from the smaller things on ground level, back to James with those elephants. The elephant has now crossed the drainage line, thankfully still with us, and he's now feeding on something called flu... Uh, no, it's not. What is this tree? It's a gruvia, gruvia flavescence, or a... Um, I always forget what the common names of these raisins are. Hmm? Raisin bush, yes, but which raisin bush? That's the thing. I think it's sandpaper raisin, that's right. It's a sandpaper raisin. It's got a very, uh, a very sort of rough leaf. Very peaceful, as I was saying. He's just picking out the little bits of the tree that he wants. Well, Nicky's just pointed out that his eye is in fact weeping. Yeah, it is. He's, he's, he seems to be crying as well as weeping from his temporal gland. I don't know if that's got any emotional significance or if it's just perhaps he spiked himself in the eye with a, with a tree. I think that's the most likely. But definitely there is moisture coming out of his eyes as well. Isn't the colour the color in this drainage line and the shade of the deep green and the lovely sun come well lovelyish sun flowing through here it's just a wonderful kind of light at this time of the morning well done, Brian that is brilliant it's telepathic hello Gerard in Saudi Arabia um, Gerard of course is not a common uh, Arabic name. Uh, you're a South African living in uh, Saudi Arabia. And you say, look at the long hairs on his tail. It is actually really impressive. He's got a particularly impressive a splash of hairs on the bottom of his tail. And of course, people think of elephants as being hairless, which of course they are not. There are the hairs on the elephant. And you do find them sometimes on their foreheads as well especially when they're little. 
hand around their mouths. And the end of that tail, of course, those hairs are extremely coarse. They're like little bits of wire. And if you find an elephant that has expired for some reason, um, people do try and make sort of bracelets out of those hairs. Or if you find the hairs on their own sometimes, you can make bracelets out of them because they're so thick. But a very effective fly swatter. How dexterously he walks over that log. And then disappears. Only really three tons of animal and he's disappeared. <laughs> just here, he's just trying to listen to us. He's trying to see what we want, deciding whether he can, he's safe enough to stay in this area and continue to eat here. So he's just having a smell and a look at us. He's probably about 15 meters from us, 45 feet or so. place called Leesburg. I have absolutely no idea where in the world that might be, so please let us know. Excuse my geographical ignorance. Um, ben, you want to know about, the, first of all, what is the difference between dung and feces? Um, I can't actually rightly tell you. I think they're pretty much interchangeable words. Feces would be... I, I, always, th I always thought dung was a word that we used largely for herbivores. Um, but I've certainly used the term lion dung simply because the word lion feces uh, and obviously the plethora of other less pleasant words um, is just not so good. So I think they're pretty much interchangeable, Ben, but I might, I stand corrected there. I could well easily be wrong there. Right, so I, I would just use them interchangeably. Then you want to know, you know, the as for the eating of dung, why do animals do it? Is it purely for nutrition or are there other reasons? And there are two reasons, a very good reasons. One, of course, is for nutrition. Some animals exhibit what we call coprophagy, which is the eating of uh, your own dung, uh, which <laughs> is a, well, I mean, that's one step worse than having to eat your own vomit, if you like, you have to do if you're a ruminant, uh, I would say. And one of the animals or whose dung you saw today, I think it was being consumed by um, a millipede, is a scrub hare. And a scrub hare does coprophagy. They process the, their food twice. And the first time it comes out of the bottom, it's a sort of um, slimy pellet. And when it comes out again, it's like you would have seen it today with the millipede. It looks like a sort of pale white uh, pellet or dry pellet and so they do that a lot of hind gut fermenting animals like a zebra will often eat their own dung as well now that's because they don't have a particularly efficient digestive system and so it's a little bit like a ruminant it's basically passing the thing through the digestive system twice but the other important reason apart from nutritional of course is that they do need to line the stomach with bacteria. Bacteria are incredibly important if you happen to only eat um, vegetation because those bacteria contain the cellulase which are the enzymes that digest the cellulose and lignin of the saw so the structural bits of the plant material and that is very important because no mammal makes those enzymes on its own and so they have to have that bacteria and the stomach has to be sort of seeded with that bacteria and that's normally done through the eating of dung or feces. So I hope that explains your question there. But I do, I will happily stand corrected if somebody can tell me that there is a difference between dung and feces. I think they're just two different words. Oh, 
my little big boy. <laughs> Isn't this spectacular? Now, what he's doing here is just he wants to eat something here, and so he's getting close simply to say to us, you know, I, I, I'm big and I'm strong, so don't come any closer, but I'm okay with you here, I'm comfortable. Now he's only about 10 meters from us, or you know, 30 feet. Now Gilly in Milwaukee, you want to know if that was a raisin bush that we saw or a resin bush. It's raisin as in uh, raisin, sultana, dried grape. And that's what that bush is, but there is something out here called a resin bush. And the raisins are groovier trees. And so we've got the sandpaper raisin, you'll get the silver raisin, various other different kinds of raisins, and they are named so for the fruit. And then you get the resin bushes, and the Ozoroa species, and they also have a very raisin-like fruit, actually, but they're, it's R-E-S-I-N, those are the resin bushes. He's a magnificent elephant, this. Isn't he great? He's so close to us and so unaffected. He's just kind of feeling away, not worrying too much about us. And he stands roughly at this stage, at the shoulder, I'd say about 10 feet. So, I mean, he's, well, maybe nine feet. He's very tall. He's a very large animal. Michelle, sorry, you you want to know about the raisins fruit and whether it tastes like raisins. No, it doesn't. It doesn't taste like raisins at all. and doesn't even look like raisins, so I'm not sure why it's called a raisin. I suppose it tastes a little bit like a sultana um, when it's dry, but the fruit is actually quite nice. Right, should we go around the corner here? And while we are moving a little bit more, let's go across to Scott. He's got some pug marks to show you. Hopefully at the end of them will be the, um, uh, well, the, the animals that made them. Right, to Scott, see you shortly. So, we've got some interesting stuff going on here. This is the track of an animal that's running, and you can see that it's displaced the soil, indicating that there was quite a lot of movements as opposed to just walking. It was probably just after the rain, and what we can also notice is that its back pad has only got one, two lobes. So two lobes indicating a dog or a hyena. Also, you can see the claw marks. One, two, three, four, right on the edge of where the toes are. Also, you can possibly see that the toes cut into one another, creating these kind of banana shapes. So this is a hyena, it's a large hyena, and like I say, you can see how it's pushed forward and the earth's almost cracked here, indicating that this hyena was in a rush. Even the next track up here, same story. And the hyena was running in this direction, the same direction that we found some more lion tracks heading in. Now the lion tracks, again, they're not very fresh. Um, and when I, when, I, when I say that, I mean, it, they're not crisp, but that doesn't mean that the lions are far away. The lions were moving here last night, but the fact that there was a little bit of precipitation makes it difficult to work out exactly how fresh the tracks are. The good news is, and what I'm hoping, is that this hyena track running in the direction of the lions might indicate that the hyena may have heard an animal in distress, an animal that possibly these lions have caught. And with a little bit of luck, we're gonna find some lions snacking on a buffalo or something around the next corner. So we're gonna continue. It's so difficult to follow the lion tracks paw for paw. So we're just moving through the general direction. there Joe and you would like to know if we've ever driven along Drakensberg Road and this is actually the road that we are on right now we've just veered off so this is Drakensberg Road and the good news is is that we found the lion tracks again not easy to see and again they've been 
kind of the crispness has been diffused from the rain, but the one, two, three, four toes, three lobes on the back pad. Not easy to see, but heading down in this direction, again, the same direction that the hyena is running and the hyena is running down on the left-hand side of the road over here. So that's that. Cool, so we're gonna continue, but there's one last little thing that I wanna show you. I've been carrying it around for a while. It's an exceptionally rare little beetle, and we can thank Steph for finding this for us. Look at how that iridesces in the sunlight, a little bit of greeny sheen. And this is called a tortoise shell beetle. And there are the little legs, almost like a kind of horseshoe crab, which some of, some of you may be aware of. And I'm just gonna put it back onto, let me show you the shell one last time though, you didn't get a good look at that. Let's get the sun on the right side. And now you may be able to see that sheen and iridescence. Oh, it looks like it may poke its head out and do a little bit of walking for us. That'll be awesome. But another little interesting critter. There's not too much known about these little beetles. But like I said, Steph is a master of not only the big things in the bush, but a lot of the smaller things and often comes to us while we are on bushwalk with these little gems such as this the tortoise shell beetle. Beautiful green iridescent sheen there. Good, so I'm gonna put it back in the bush so it can carry on doing what tortoise shell beetles do. There we go. Look at it moving. It moved just temporarily there, but it's latched on with its legs, so let's leave it to its own devices. Very good. And send you back to James, who I'm hoping is still with that elephant. Uh-oh, here's one line track going back. Here are the toes. One, two, three, four. The back pad over here. Going back in the opposite direction. So we're gonna have to spend some time here trying to work out what exactly these lines have decided to do. In the meantime, back to James. Apparently we are live, and I'm struggling to hear the final control, but can you get more to try and lift them up for you, Brian? Um, we've got a nest here of netwing beetles, it looks like. No, they're not netwing beetles. Those are bugs. I'm just going to try and retrieve my insect book and see what kind of bugs they are. Now, bugs, when I use the term bug, of course, it is a very specific um, order of insects. It's not simply a generic term for creepy, crawly things that people don't like. Let me find if we can see if we can find them. And I think they're bugs as opposed to beetles because of those, just their shape. They look like those. It's just the kind of shape that a bug has. Um, there are obviously far more biological reasons for calling things bugs. Here we go. I think that's precisely what they are. They're called cotton stainers or red fire bugs. You get lots of different kinds of them, but that seems to be what they are. A cotton stainer, red bug or fire bug. You happy with that, Brian? Mm. I will tell you about their biology now, if you like. There they are in the book. Plant feeders, often associated with hibiscus. These are not on the hibiscus. These chaps are feeding on a thing called a red spike thorn, or Gymnosporia senegalensis. And they're often pests for cotton. That's why they're called cotton stainers. And the nymphs, okay, so if you're a, if you're a beetle and you're immature, you have a, a larva, or if, same as if you are a caterpillar, or if you're a butterfly as a caterpillar, uh, you're the larva of caterpillar, and you have what we call a hollow metabolic life, um, hollow metabolic um, metamorphosis, which basically means that you change completely from a larva into the adult. These bugs have got a hemi-metabolic life cycle, and 
that means that the nymphs or youngsters, these are definitely youngsters, resemble the adults. They're just slightly smaller versions of the adults, and often they are found together. They're quite, quite gregarious, where the adults will not be. So that's quite interesting. And I suspect what they're doing, why they're eating this tree. Now, they're, they're obviously that red and black color, and a red and black color is often um, sort of indicative of poison. And if you look at a monarch butterfly, that's the most obvious answer, or obvious example. It's orange and black, and it's indicative of the fact that it's possessed of alkaloids that it's picked up from milkweed plants as a larva. And I think these nymphs are eating on this plant, this gymnosporia plant, it's very full of tannins. And I suspect they're eating on this plant in order to absorb those tannins and perhaps make themselves distasteful. And I'm sure that's why they're that orange and black color. And you will find not many mammals will enjoy eating this tree. And I mean, it can be, it's got chemical compounds that act as a sort of local anesthetic. And I know I've eaten eaten some and Brent has eaten some. And what it does is it really kind of numbs the mouth. Beautiful. Right, so that's the cotton stainer. Fascinating. Done. Let us leave these cotton stainers to their Gymnosporia senegalensis breakfast and press on, shall we? Yes. Nothing really going on on Arethusa, like I say. That elephant is the most action they've had at the moment. But a very, very pretty morning so nice to be sitting at this time of the day and not sweating. Nice and cool. I believe we might be in for a little bit more rain today. It'll be very nice indeed. in Virginia. We were watching that elephant eating and of course we know that elephants can be quite destructive and judges who want to know what's the biggest tree I've ever seen an elephant push over. Um, probably a large knob thorn tree sort of about this size here. That's probably about the biggest that I've seen an elephant push over. They are definitely capable of pushing over larger ones like a big they can push over. They'll struggle to push over big jackalberries because the ebony wood in the jackalberry tends to be a bit denser. They'll struggle to push over leadwood trees, for example. I don't think they'd even try. And some of the fig trees, perhaps, as well, they will struggle to push over. But the marulas and the knob forms are the ones that take the most hammering. I've never seen a, a jackalberry push over. at the moment, or perhaps this is your biology lesson for the day. Um, Taylor, you want to know if we only look at the male elephants or if we look at the herds as well with the females. Taylor, we actually normally see mostly the herds. There's a little diker going through there. We normally see 
Oh, sorry, hang on. I got the question wrong. The comms are not great. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, Taylor, you want to know if, they, if the herds will only throw the males out or if they throw the females out as well? It's only the males. The females get to stay in the herd because they, um, it's just, there are various reasons for it. But in so many mammal species, what happens is that the nursery herd will remain together. And it is often um, a group of females, related females. Lions, it's the same. Elephants, it's the same. You'll find with, what else, hyenas, it's the same. It's normally the males that disperse away from the family or away from the natal group. Males, because of their hormonal makeup, are happier on their own. They don't need the same kind of social interaction. That's the same for human beings. Uh, you'll find that males are more likely to be happy in small groups or on their own than they are than females. And it's the same with elephants. The other reason is that, and it's, it's a reason that pervades the whole mammal kingdom, is that males move away from the dispersal group and the family splits up in order to avoid inbreeding. So the males of hyenas will go to other clans where they're unrelated females and they'll breed there. The males of elephants will go away from the herd in which they're born and go and breed with other elephants. And I think that's probably the reason. They also, you know, the, the hormone that makes you male is something called testosterone and it does result in quite a lot of aggression. It makes... Um, it makes all males of mammals quite aggressive and so that's often why they are not tolerated within a herd especially with you know in a herd of elephants the matriarch will not put up with a male after he turns 17 because he gets very full of testosterone and he starts getting quite boisterous and, and starts to bully the youngsters and the big cow won't tolerate that and so she tosses him out i hope that answers your question it's a very interesting one and i think it's quite a um ooh, Brian, I don't know, can you see the squirrel sunning himself over here just on that horizontal pale branch there. I'm not sure if you'll get an angle from where you are. You got him? No, I don't see. Yeah, I can see him. Yeah, he's moving now. Little rodent. I hope that kind of answers your question, Taylor. It's an interesting one. So males of just about all mammals will disperse away from the family. And one of the interesting ones that doesn't, actually, is the human being. And in human Stone Age societies and village societies, uh, you'll find it's females that move away from their homes to go and live with the male families, or the male's family, the man's family, rather than otherwise. And I think that's really quite interesting. Why that is, I'm not really sure. Um, speaking of rodents, um, I just want to show you something. Um, <laughs> I've mentioned that we've had a bit of rodent problem in camp of late. And uh, yesterday evening, uh, Brian and Andrew called me to their, they called me to their room. And I was supposed to be filming and helping them and uh, Brian, how's that for you? I'm going to show you a video here of exactly what went down in Brian's and Andrew's room. I don't think there was any bad language in this. Is that all right? How's that, Brian? Yeah. Better? Yeah, that's good. Okay, here we go, everybody. So that is Andrew standing on his bed with a large stick. So none of us covered ourselves in glory. We were all rather pathetic. Um, I, Andrew, as you saw there, was standing on the bed and he said, I was hoping for a bit of an interview, and he said, because I'm scared of, as he said, rap, this thing came out from under the bed where Brian had chased him. I leapt six feet into the air. I let out a yelp that was very unbecoming for a man. And then the rat, and it was a big rat, went running underneath uh, the, the room in which Brian and Andrew lived. It was very, very funny indeed. <laughs> 
And the reason for that story, of course, the squirrel is also a rodent, as is the rat. Right, something far less terrifying for Andrew this morning, the carapace of a chelonid. Let's head across to Scott. So, uh, I'm told you've all been enjoying the humorous tale of Andrew having a complete hysterical fit last night when a rat took off from under his bed. I hope you saw the video. I'm not sure if you actually did, but um, there is video footage of Andrew panicking. And, <laughs> and I guess it wasn't only Andrew that James does admit to letting off a shriek. Now, this is a lot more of a stable scenario, so Andrew is copus mentis, he's in control. And sadly, we're not too sure what happened to this uh, hinge-back tortoise, speaks hinge-back tortoise. It's been uh, lying dead here for quite a while, I presume. It looks like um, it, it's, it's been here for quite some time. It's scutes, which are these keratin, little la thin, paper-thin keratin layers which cover their bony shell and give them color. One of them had already fallen off and as you can see, they, I peeled this other one off with absolute ease. We can tell that it's a male because the undercarriage is very flat and the undercarriage, or sorry, a female rather, the undercarriage of a male will be concave so that when he mounts the female, he can fit on. With, with this one, it would keep sliding off if this was in fact a male. So that's how you can sex tortoises quite easily by looking underneath onto their plastron. Something that we don't get to show you very often, and sadly it's seized because it's been dead for so long, is the hinge. And the hinge of the, the hinge-back tortoise runs along this little grain or groove here and if I twist the shell around you may just be able to see inside here and basically this whole portion of opening here can be closed this back portion of shell can clamp down covering up the rear end of the tortoise making sure that predators can't get to it obviously not all the time because something got to this one not too sure what the there was even the shell that had been chewed up of another one nearby so, if we come and take a look over here, we can see where some predator, possibly a desperate hyena or a young male lion, those are the, the usual candidates that feed on tortoises. Here you can see all the fragments of shell. So even though they are fairly well protected with their shells, they are not invincible to all predators. And we're guessing that maybe these two were in the throes of passion when they were ambushed and consumed and that's why there's two shells so close together cool now that's all just speculation of course but a lot of track and sign and reading into the bush is just kind of letting your imagination flow we veered off the road we've got a feeling the lion are somewhere in this area but not too sure where so we're going to start taking a closer look around over here Aha, Kyle, who's just 15 years old, uh, who's one of our vocalization experts. Kyle, I've been loving your, your little audios. The hyena audio that you made, though, was incredible. Your leopard was good, but your hyena was incredible. Now, Kyle, you've on the same wavelength as me and hoping that the hyena tracks that we saw running towards the same direction that the lions were moving in will indicate that the lions have possibly made a kill and that's why the hyena was also heading into this area with the chance of possibly picking up some scraps. So definitely Kyle, well done for piecing that little puzzle together and let's hope that we can find the lion with the kill now. Obviously easier said than done. And as the bush starts getting a little bit thicker, up ahead here you can see there's a wall of thick vegetation. It's often good just to stop. As soon as you start feeling un uncertain or a little bit unsafe, stop. And I think that rule can be applied not only in the African wilderness, but just as a general rule in life. Stop moving forward if you're not feeling safe, because that's generally where the trouble is going to come from. It's generally not going to come from behind you. The wind is strongly in our favor, as you can tell from my little ash bag. And again, it's in our favor, but is it in our favor? Because half of me thinks if animals smell me and know that I'm on the way, they're going to be ready for us. Whereas if they don't know that we're coming in thick bush like this, it's a bit windy, they may not cheer us, they may not smell us, then all of a sudden we're on top of them and they understandably get nervous. 
So we're just going to slow things down a little bit here. Obviously, we're also tracking lines, so that's on the top of our brain. But it's important that you don't get fixated on the animal you're looking for, because if all you're worried about is lion, you may not be focused on a large gray mass like an elephant or a buffalo, which is equally, if not more, dangerous. Sarah in Ohio and good to have you on the bush walk with us. Sarah you'd like to know why earlier on I said I don't think the Birmingham boys are on the property and that's basically just because we've kept in touch with the other guides and other rangers who know where they're moving and they haven't been very very close to Juma recently. Now well, they actually have been quite close, um, just not onto our property. And the reason why I said I'm hoping they're going to come back is because it's long overdue. They haven't been to check this part of their territory. And because they haven't been here to check, they're going to start worrying and wondering, what's going on there? Are there other lions there? You know, they're going to need to come back and check. And I guess the reason we know that they haven't been here is because we know they've been found elsewhere. And we're driving around here every day and not seeing any tracks of them, any sign of them. But that will change, Sarah, that definitely will change. They're gonna come back for a visit and they'll come back and probably spend a lot of time here at some point. But for now, they've got business to deal with elsewhere. Watch out for the thorns here, Andrew. Uh, well done. What did I do without you, Andrew? Thank you very much. The most important part of the bushwalk, the ash bag, watch out for the thorns there, and on the left here, these are the nasty thorns of the buffalo thorn tree, and they've got straight thorns, and I guess this example of a hook thorn is a good one here, as well as the hook thorns, so a very nasty thorn tree to get strung up in, so make sure you avoid that. <laughs> well, Liz Lapa, you would like to know who's leaving food around that's attracting the rodents into Andrew and Brian's room. Well, Andrew fancies himself as quite an <clears throat> animal whisperer and who knows what little treats or snacks he's, he's, <laughs> he's got hidden in his room. He's not sharing them with, that, with us, Liz, so that's his own little secret stash. But he's paying the price now because he's got the rats coming to join in on the action. Now I'm told that I think Nikki is going to try and play you that clip now. Um, so brace yourselves, get ready to laugh hysterically at Andrew and James. Again, Liz, you, you, you mentioned that, oh, Andrew's getting stuck in another thorn tree there. Um, Liz, you also mentioned that it's phenomenal that these guys are willing to stand up to lion and elephant and all these big dangerous animals but as soon as there's a rat in the room it's all, all pandemonium breaks loose. So after the video you're going to go straight back to James, enjoy it and we'll see you later. Okay here we go everybody. So that is Andrew standing on his bed with a large stick. Tell us why you're standing on the bed. I think that's very unfair of Nicola to be playing that clip publicly again. Quite enough embarrassment. And as some of you were asking how it is that we can possibly be afraid of a rat when we are, you know, we stand and we go and view elephants, wild dog on foot. And um, well, it, was a, it was a big rat. And it's something about the movement that a rodent like that has that just terrifies the wits out of a human being. I don't know, I, I was very calm. 
Yeah, sorry, we're going back to Bushwalk. Let's go back to Bushwalk. Okay, well, some exciting stuff's happening here. That's why we raced you back to this Warburg's Eagle. It's a pale morph, and there it is shaking its wings, and you can see it's looking around. And what it's looking for are some crested Franklins that we saw running into that fallen down bush willow tree. And the Franklins have got quite a few young chicks with them. And this Warburg's Eagle is hoping to find its breakfast chair. And it'll be interesting to see what it, it does. It's just landed about 30 seconds or a minute ago. And now it knows that it's gonna have the hard job of trying to pinpoint exactly where these Franklin and their chicks may be hiding. And Franklin will, especially the chicks, and a lot of ground dwelling birds will have cryptic camouflage and that cryptic camouflage will mean that they can just drop flat and keep dead still whenever a predator comes onto the scene. You can see the Warburg's eagle that knows they there and now it's just trying to pinpoint exactly where they are. When I first initially saw this uh, eagle plummeting out of the sky I thought that may be a tawny eagle a slightly larger raptor that was swooping down to keep an eye on the lion and their kill but no joy Warburg's eagle are not good indicators for finding kills so to speak but that was the initial thought of joy that went through my mind then I saw the Franklin running off and realized that the eagle had alternate plans still searching carefully and I don't want to send you anywhere because things could escalate dramatically in a very, very short space of time. Who knows how high up in the sky it was when it saw these Franklin running about. And Andrew's gonna, go, have you gone in for the double tap? No, I need you to push it. Okay, so I'm gonna help Andrew by pushing the double tap to get you closer in. There we go. Now bear in mind everyone that it may be a little bit shaky, but he's already been holding this pose for quite some time. Well done, Andrew. Great work on camera. And look at how wonderful it is that you can see it's searching desperately for breakfast, looking all around. And I'm really interested to see what its next move is going to be. Is it going to try and clamber through that thick bush? I doubt it, but then again, I've never seen a Warburg's Eagle in this kind of situation. So this is a first for me. And that's why I don't want to send you anywhere just yet. This is really interesting stuff. And Andrew, as soon as you need a break, you're more than welcome to zoom out. And then if things heat up again, I guess we can charge back in there with a punch zoom as the cameraman like to call it but now you'll get an idea that we're quite close to this bird of prey and even though we are here it's not too concerned by us and I guess the reason why is that it knows there's a possible me meal nearby so wonderful stuff that we are looking for a larger cat-like predator and then an avian predator swooped down and stole the show and that is what I love about being on these live safaris is that we can expect to we can expect the unexpected all the time basically and we may set out for certain goals or achievements every drive very seldom come through with that but have a great journey along the way and this is a, a wonderful example of that you just never know what's going to intrigue you and what's going to come across and like I said, this is a first for me. I've never seen a Warburg's eagle hunting like this. You'd expect, expect them to just kind of swoop down if they didn't catch anything, move off. But it's seriously investing some time here. Just making sure that there's no chicks hiding out in this thick bush. What's interesting and what I'm surprised by is that there's no Franklin alarm calling and usually what would happen and if I think it was closer to actually making a kill there'd be the adults shouting very loudly 
to not only warn their chicks but also to just let this predatory bird know that it's been detected, it's wasting its time. And like most predators, without the elements of surprise, that opportunity to succeed is basically gone. Hmm. What to do, what to do. Like I said, because there's no Franklin's alarm calling, because it's been perched there for quite some time without any luck, I think it might be worth us continuing on and seeing what else we can find. Just saw a dark patch up ahead of us there. I thought it could have been a dead buffalo. But it was just a fallen down stump quite through in the thick vegetation there. So not the buffalo kill that we were hoping for, but at least we got to see that interesting Warburg's eagle sighting and now we get to carry on. What I would like to find is some excavations. Oh, well done, Andrew. <laughs> oh, you too funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I keep hoping that he's actually going to have found something interesting, but that's not likely with Andrew. He's only going to find my sock, which is useful, but not that exciting. <laughs> uh, good times. Good times. So whenever I get to a very sandy patch like this, it's good to just check that no lion have moved through here, <clears throat> not looking promising. There's a few antelope that have been running again after the rain. Who knows, maybe running from the lion. Okie dokes, well, we're gonna continue prospering on, on this beautiful cool morning here in the Sabi Sands. And while we do, you're gonna be back on the vehicle with James. Well, I'm afraid this morning is turning out to be fairly mammal free other than that elephant that we saw earlier. A couple of birds, plenty of flies and um, of course some, uh, some uh, oh, sorry, not some bambalai, we're not on some bambili. Everybody, we're not trespassing, some bambili is just over to the left hand side of us here. We're on Arethusa. Lots of flies, lots of cotton stainer bugs and one elephant. That was close. No, you're not on, I did trespass once onto some Mambalai by mistake. It was very early on in my career here. And it was with Jean Dre, and he, I think it was his first night out actually. And we suddenly noticed that those enormous bumps you see us go over that whoop, whoop, suddenly smoothed out. Suddenly the road was like a highway. And um, we couldn't really figure it out until we popped out on the northern fence. Um, well, beyond where we should have been. Thankfully, no one saw us. Um, I, nobody knows and knew about it. They do now, of course. But you know you're on Arethusa when you go over these bumps. Adrenaline rush, you say I need to put that video onto YouTube or Facebook. No, no, that's not going to happen. Sorry about that, Brendan Rush. It was embarrassing enough as it was. I like the fact that you couldn't really see it properly. Right, well, we're coming out of uh, Arethusa, not some Bambalai, and we're going back on to Buyatela or Juma now. bumps are big, so we are on the right place. Up, over. Up, over. Ah, interesting question from James Bear, a great birder, or ornithologist, or Enthusiast. 
Um, James, you want to know about the common house sparrow and why we've never pointed it out or why I've never pointed it out. I've never seen one here. Um, I've used to see them in the village at Ngala, in the Star Village. There were plenty of Casa Domesticus or house sparrows. I've never seen one here, actually, and certainly not out in the wild. I've, I haven't looked too closely around the camps, but I've never seen a house sparrow here. Very good question, because normally, of course, they occur all over the place. Anywhere you have a human habitation, Casa Domesticus is in... Um, generally in great abundance. So we're just heading down the gap now between Juma and Arethusa, not some Bambalai, to our right. And we will turn back on to Juma shortly. outside of Africa would I like to go and visit and see so that I could study the natural history. Um, Jim, I would like to go and see polar bears. That would be wonderful to go and see. So I suppose to go and investigate the northern reaches of Canada or Russia would be fascinating. I would love to see wolves as well. And so anywhere where they had wolves would be fascinating for me. Um, I'm just trying to think, oh, the other place, uh, the wildlife of Australia, I find very fascinating. And so I would like to go and see the wildlife of Australia. The, um, you know, everything hops in Australia. And it hops in Australia because the continent of this Australasia is so nutrient poor. Well, not the entire continent, but the land mass of Australia is so nutrient poor. And that means that animals have had to develop the most efficient possible way to move. And the most efficient possible way for animals to move in is to hop. elasticity of the muscle and what that does is that it makes hopping them very incredibly incredibly um, efficient way of moving and so everything in Australia hops and I'd love to go and see that sort of thing. The birds there are obviously amazing. I'd love to see the bird, the animals of South America I mean there's just too many places the animals of South America of course would be fascinating in the Pantanal or in the Amazon strange occurrence of that man driving this great the great urgency past us. Not sure where he was going. He's possibly run out of milk. I look freezing. Um, Ruth, I'm certainly not freezing. I'm a very pleasant temperature. Um, now, very pleasant sort of balmy 21 degrees Celsius at the moment, which is about 69 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's actually very nice out. Yeah, I've got a jersey on because my body simply isn't used to uh, being at anything less than 700 degrees. This is where we went on to Arethusa this morning. This is where we had the dwarf mongoose just around here. And some, uh, the, what, what else did we have? We had long-tailed shrikes. We had rollers, hornbills. No leopards, unfortunately. Apparently you sent her a video of magpies at a, what you described as a funeral where one was hit by a car. There's the, the, the bowler. It's not landed. 
standing anywhere near us. Um, uh, at a funeral, and it was hit by a car and surrounded by other magpies. Um, are you sure it wasn't a feast so much as a funeral? I mean, I'm pretty sure a magpie being related to a crow quite happily eat his brethren were it to be run over by a car, but that sounds fascinating. Thank you, Safari Dean. As I say quite often, we continue to learn from our viewers at least as much as we manage to impart to them. Scott on foot. They're going to be creeping very quietly with the current sighting that they've got. I'll see you just now. Okay, we need a whisper now, everyone. And we've heard some branches breaking in this thick bush. By we, I mean Steph, he is the ears. And you can actually you can actually see one of them. It's far away, and Andrew's gonna have his work cut off for him showing this to you. I think you're going to get to that, Andrew. You can see the ear flapping there. Well done, Andrew. And that's one elephant. Now, what you need to be careful of is that even though that's the one we can see, I'm fairly confident there's quite a few closer by, judging from the audio that we've been hearing. Again, the wind is strongly in our favor, very, very strongly in our favor, blowing all over Andrew. Perfect. <laughs> and. Let's just keep moving along here. We are out in the open, yes, so not much cover, but because the wind is in our favor, because elephants don't have great eyesight, I'm not too concerned. Even though I feel that this could be a breeding herd of elephants, which are the ones that you need to be careful of, protective mothers trying to look after their young. Just want to make sure there aren't any closer by that we can get you a better view of. James Doherty, you would like to know exactly how good elephant's eyesight is, and it's not great. Um, I know for a fact that them hearing you or smelling you is often going to be more likely than them necessarily seeing you. So as long as you use good cover, creep up, use shadows, you can often get fairly close to elephants. Um, so not the best eyesight out of the animals. To what degree they see in color, I'm not too sure. Um, basically, how it works is I can see one that's going to be close to impossible for you guys to see. It's just to the left of that tall tree there, Andrew, in the vegetation there. Um, below that weeping wattle that's blowing wildly in the wind. And well done, Andrew, you're doing great work on the camera. You might see the ivory glistening now, as it looks like they're feeding towards us very slowly. And again, I think those could be members at the back of the herd, and there could be some, there's a bit of a valley here. There could be a few, a little bit closer to us. And I think Steph's just spotted one a little bit closer to us. So we're just going to back up. Always a good thing to do when you're not entirely sure of the situation you're in. Just get an extra ground between you and the animals. You can always go closer again once you know that you're safe. So Steph did spot one again. It's just so thick here. And we don't want to take any chances. Again, the aim of what we're doing on these walks is, yes, to try and get close to big game when possible, but not all the time. Andrew's found another one. That's, I think. Um, but it's a large herd that's spread out all over. There's one Ellie that's just about to pop out. And it's going to be a great view just through these, this fallen down tree, Andrew. It's coming straight towards us. And if it doesn't get caught up, having a tasty snack we're going to get a great view but what we're going to do is we're going to get into position to receive these elephants that are slowly feeding towards us and while we do we're going to send you across to james who has got a huge huge surprise enjoy Fantastic, everybody. Brian, sorry, excuse my eyes. Brian's super hearing has picked up the alarm calling of a baby wildebeest. And as we drove down here, the Inkahuma Pride, those three lionesses that we saw yesterday, are just in here. They're definitely hunting. They missed that wildebeest. There may actually be four of them in here. 
missed the young wildebeest, which means all 10 apparently will now survive. That was a very close call. We saw it tearing across the, the road, followed closely by its mother. Ooh, and this female is limping badly now. Just the three of them. Maybe this isn't the Inkahumas. interesting. Just get into a position where we can see them. They're obviously still hunting. Stop for a second. You can see limping quite badly there. Now this is the same group that we saw last night. I can see from the mud on the back there. So just to reiterate, we heard wah, 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 and Brian said, stop, stop, I can hear something. And then the wildebeest mother exploded out of the bush, followed closely by her little youngster. That injury is new. That was not there last night. <laughs> factory contact. This female in front of us is really not looking good. I wonder what happened. They were obviously hunting last night. Let's head back across to Scotty's with the elephants, and I will try and get into a slightly better viewing position here. Look at the magnificent ivory on this elephant cow, and what a turn of events. Right towards the end of the sunrise safari, the stars of the big five, the elephant and lion, are gracing us with their presence. How wonderful. And this herd of Ellie's has kind of changed direction. They spread out all through this bush here. There's another one. Andrew, you are working this camera like an absolute wizard. And they've been changing direction actually, but it's still suiting us. The wind is still heavily, heavily in our favor. Oh, covered the camera with dust there, so apologies if you cannot see anything anymore. But it emphasizes how good the wind is and that's what's allowing us to be in this close proximity to these eddies. I think we can even now that looks like they've done a full 360 almost which is bizarre. Looks like we can probably creep along a little bit further even though it's open it's because I'm confident that with our neutral colors we're wearing they're not going to detect us and we should get some more good views of them here. It's interesting the lion tracks that we have here are probably 
of the same animals that you are currently with with James and they've done a very large circle basically back from the eastern boundary where we are on Jumanal to the western sections where James is and well done to James for finding them always wonderful when you read into the signs of the wilds which in this case was the wildebeest running off in alarm and it was that kind of inch being in tune with the bush telegraph that got James and you guys into the right position with those lines so well done to him for making that happen looks like these elephants are moving back away into some thick vegetation rather than putting any unnecessary pressure on them we're going to let them move off the whole herd is really bunched up together now and you can see quite a few of them moving through there not too sure what got their attention. I found it impossible that they would have caught our wind, but maybe some of the, the herd members in front actually moved far enough to, to walk where we had walked, therefore not rely on the wind to pick up our scent. And maybe that's why they've turned around. Either way, it's been a great sighting, and it sounds like James has got into another good position for you guys to get some good views of those lions. Nightmare, you say one of them has been limping for always almost a year. You say she always gets hurt. Um, yeah, this this injury definitely wasn't here yesterday. We saw them all walking around yesterday. And if, as you say, if there has been one that has been injured for a year, I doubt it's the same lioness simply because they lose condition. So if, if that if that limp 
continues. The muscles on the back left of her rump will start to atrophy because she won't be using them as much. And she will then be unable to keep up with the others. So yeah, but lions often, as you say, lions often will have limps and they take, I mean, it's a tremendously physical existence they live when they're not sleeping. They've got lots of hunting to do and that hunting is not easy. And this is where they are going to settle, I suspect, for much of the rest of the day. I'll just sneak slightly forward, but I think this is what the day is going to bring for these lions. Again, I'm very confused and worried as to where the fourth, the other youngster is. We know that there is one lioness on the coral at the moment, amber eyes with four Birmingham males, and number three here, but where the sibling of that one there is, I just, I don't know. Look at the spotting that you still got on the iron quarters there. She almost looks like a leopard. It's her sibling, the other youngster that's missing. And certainly wasn't missing, was, was nowhere near yesterday. Now Scott and Steph began, or Scott and Andrew and Steph began looking for these lions around where we found them yesterday evening. They're a long, long way from that now. Probably, and they're in a southwesterly direction and probably about four or five kilometers from where we saw them yesterday. Shall I sneak forward a bit, Brian? Just sneak forward so Brian's got a view of that rather beautiful lion. Very exhausted. Oh, there we go. Have a snooze. A stroke of luck that was. Done, Brian. Good job. Yeah, you see, she won't maintain muscle mass in the back leg there if this injury persists inside. I don't think it's an old injury at all. Although it could have been an old injury that was sort of redone. Maggie M in Australia. I love getting these questions just because I can't answer them, and which means it's going, I'm going to have some learning. Maggie, you want to know why it is that a cat's footprint is known as a pug mark? Um, I have got no idea, Maggie. Brian, do you have any idea? I don't. Um, so if anyone can enlighten us, that would be great. I've got no idea, I'm afraid, Maggie. Very good question. I, I've, ne I've never even thought about it. But yes, for some reason, cats' footprints are known as pug marks. Let's try and see their faces again. They're lying under a variable bush willow. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry says that a pug mark 
um, is in fact it comes from a Hindi term meaning foot. And that's why every individual animal has a, a distinctive pug or foot mark. So it apparently can re refer to any animal. But out here, certainly, I would never refer to a, uh, a rhino or a, uh, an elephant's footprint as a pug mark. It's normally just the cats. But I suppose you could use it for any term. So it must have come from the time of the Raj, I suppose. Thank you, Maggie. the two adults here and then the sub-adult behind. Sub-adult is missing. And Nikki's just saying these two were chased off by a scrapper at a kill. I'm not sure when that was. Uh, that was on Torchwood in October. Thanks, Sarah. In Ohio, you say when used last saw the Nguhuma pride with Brent, one of them was um, limping in the front, on one of the front feet. Yeah, and like I say, Sarah, that's a good point because obviously these lions do live very physical lives. They have, uh, they take a lot of uh, punishment during their hunting because, I mean, if you imagine trying to take down, so she's about 120, 130 kilograms, taking down a fully grown wildebeest or buffalo weighing sometimes twice, sometimes four times as much as they do, you're gonna get hurt every so often. And so what, they're incredibly good at healing. These animals are incredibly strong, but they will get injured every so often and limp about the place. And that's why you will never find something like a leopard taking the risks that a lion would. It doesn't matter here if this injury lasts for a week or two, she will still be able to eat because she will follow the rest of the pride. They will kill and she will share the kill. Because if you're a leopard, of course, or a cheetah, you can't do that. If you get injured like that, you won't eat until such time as that injury is healed sufficiently for you to be able to hunt again. So I think that's very interesting. very physical life trying to catch things to eat and not easy I mean that wildebeest calf is not big and they've smoked something and I don't think that those wildebeest would have been alone in here you know just the cow and her calf so maybe there are others around Any theories on where the other youngster is would be greatly received. I wonder where on earth they are. But I don't think they're going to go far from here now. And Christy, you also worried about where the other one is and whether they will be reunited soon. I've got a nasty feeling about her, I must say. I wonder if she hasn't been lost. Simply because I can't see or imagine a reason why she'd be on her own away from the rest of the pride. She hasn't been seen mating with the other... Unless, you know, there are four Birminghams on Coral now, or they've just headed into the Kruger Park with Amber Eyes. 
I mean, unless the fifth Birmingham male is maybe perhaps with the other sub-adult, maybe that's happening, that's why she's not here. She's just old enough to be mating, so that's possible. They're very cleverly lying down here, so they will sleep here probably for many hours, but lying where they are would be almost impossible if you were on foot or you were a wildebeest wandering through here trying to pick up bits and pieces of new fresh grass that had popped up as a result of the spots of rain we had yesterday. You'd hardly see them. It'd be almost impossible to see them. Let's head across to Scott while these cats lie here, see what he's got to show us, and I'll see you back here in just a little while. Well, very happy to uh, say that we've ma managed to find you guys some millipede remains. And this is obviously a scorpion's home in and amongst this fallen down combretum tree, and you can see all the little white ringlets that make up the millipede's body that I'm collecting here. So there we go, evidence of a scorpion that's been doing some good housekeeping and also testament to the fact that they do in fact eat these millipedes, which not many other animals do. I'm not sure if you can see this tiny little droplet of moisture that's just landed on me. So that is a raindrop. Hopefully we get lots more rain between the safaris and even if it means the afternoon safari is a bit wet, we need rain desperately. So one little droplet's fallen and a good omen, I guess, for the end of the sunrise safari. It's been great fun having you on Bushwalk. Andrew, thanks for your great camera. Oh, another raindrop. Good stuff. Also to Steph, who's lurking in the shadows, thanks very much to him for joining us and making sure that we get home safely without being trampled to death by anything. Always a relief that. And well then to Nikki for directing the show and to Jerry who is lending her hand. Thank you so much for all your contributions. Goodbye for now and back to James. Unsurprisingly the lions have not gone anywhere at the stage and I think that, like I said I don't think they're likely to. Anyway we've got a few minutes left to drive. And very nice to spend a bit of time with some lions who we haven't seen around for a while. I think things are probably settling down now with the lions. <clears throat> We've got a situation where the Birmingham boys are comfortable. They've taken over. Uh, it doesn't look like any further threats are coming just yet. Obviously, there's those nine sky bed males which we've heard of from the north, and they may well come down here at some stage. Now, this you're on Twitter and you say that it doesn't look like they've had much to eat recently. I would agree with you completely. This, they're not um, skinny, it doesn't look like they are sort of malnourished at all at this stage, but they don't have those full bellies of lions that have just eaten. So they will be ready to hunt. And certainly it looked like they were doing that yesterday. They moved during the day yesterday when it was cloudy and windy. And then they were obviously hunting when we found them this morning. So I think they'd be more than happy to have a, a meal now. Michelle in Michigan, a very nice question and one, I mean, we do discuss it every so often, but I haven't mentioned it for a while, the black on the back of a lion's ears, why is it there? We think, Michelle, that it's a following mechanism and if they are hunting, of course, then they are moving and they spread out through the bush and that black juxtaposes quite nicely with the tawny colour on their bodies and it's quite an easy thing to see. It's the same reason they've got that black pom-pom on the back of their tails. And you wouldn't think, in this kind of light, it's not that obvious. But I can tell you that in, when the light is low, 
it's amazing how obvious that black color is when they're moving through kind of the dusk light through bush like this. That black is very obvious indeed. And I suspect that's why they've got the black. It's a following mechanism that helps them when they're hunting. The leopards would have it for the same reason, not for hunting so much, but possibly for their cubs, so that the cubs can follow them. Now it's just starting to warm up now, and the cats will be going to sleep. And Sarah, you reckon that maybe my assertion that the other lioness is with a Birmingham boy is quite possible because at least two lionesses have been seen mating with the Birmingham boys of late, so maybe it is that that's where the other young lioness is. Thank you, Sarah. I've been very busy today. It's good news. There's also Sarah yesterday who informed me that Nkuhuma was the Tsonga name for a brown ivory tree, and I will still try and find one. I haven't seen one today, but they are around. It's a little bit embarrassing when somebody in Ohio is able to tell you a Shangan or Tsonga word that you should really know. So thank you very much for that, Sarah. So just a few more minutes. I think we'll sit here for these last few minutes with these lions. Just enjoy their company. Try not to fall asleep with them. I find watching an, any animal fall asleep makes me immediately want to do precisely the same. Luckily, I don't have to hunt a wildebeest there. I can just go to camp and have a delicious breakfast. What's for breakfast today, Brian? Is it muffin day? Yes, I think it's muffin day. Yeah. I'll be having seeds and cheese and coffee. You have a muffin, Brian? Probably. Probably. <laughs> Maybe a bowl of cereal. And Texas, Chris, I would agree with you completely. Uh, you're on YouTube and you reckon that these lions are looking healthy. I would agree completely. I think they look very well, other than the limp which could be gone by lunchtime, like I say. And just to reiterate, I mean, we heard that young wildebeest calf bellowing. It was a real distress call. And I suspect that that injury has happened right now. I wonder if the mother didn't smash into that youngster, at least the older one. again. But nobody seems to have heard me and I think the guys from Cheetah Plains are interested. Station, this is the three in Kahuma in Kahuma's here. And they're in the block I and mean, quite thick stuff between Balanites and Zoe's on this south western side of that junction but they are static at the moment right nobody else is coming here today So we'll see what unfolds here this afternoon. Well, we won't. It is the lovers' turn this afternoon. Jamie and Brent, of course, they will be out on drive this afternoon. And with any luck, they'll refind these lions and possibly some leopards, cheetahs, wild dogs, elephants, and buffalo as well. Right, a big thank you. That's it from us today. A big thank you from um, us. Brian and I, to Scott, and uh, there's Brian's thumb. 
Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Good James. job today. Thank you. A big thanks to Nikki and Jerry in the final control, to Scott and Andrew on the walk with Steph. We will, and all of you for your questions and comments. It's so good to hear from you and such a great learning experience. We'll see you later. Bye-bye and stay safe.